Great, fantastic. Okay, so um, I'll start with an introduction. So my name is Imrana Mahmoud and I'm a freelance creative producer and arts educationalist. Um, today, my presentation is on the, the art of representation. Um, so basically a lot of my work has been um, working with um, underrepresented communities, um, both young people and quite from an intergenerational um, aspects as well. Um, so what I was thinking today was just to share a few slides um, to talk about some of my previous work, but mainly talk about from my experience, some of the barriers that um, you, you, people from minoritized communities tend to face. Um, and I use the term minoritized because actually when we just say minority, we're actually putting um, some, we're actually placing um, a restriction on certain communities. Um, I think not recognizing actually um, the systemic kind of inequalities that cause that to happen. Um, so there'll be certain terms that I'll use and I'll explain that as I'm going along. Um, so I'm just gonna share, start off sharing my slides. So it should be here. Great, okay. Oh no, that's not where we should be at all. Let me just start again, sorry about that. Great, okay, so I hope you can all see um, the slides. So um, I'll see the art of representation is what I'll be speaking about um, today. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the power of language. Um, so what you can see on here is um, the terms hard to reach communities, working class communities, diverse communities. Um, now, what was really interesting is um, my background is actually um, in secondary, uh, as a secondary teacher. Um, I was teaching science actually. When I first came into um, the arts world, it was really surprising that I was being labeled as being from a hard to reach community. Um, and especially because I grew up in a culture in my upbringing was very much um, creative all the time. Um, I was into, you know, Gwali music. Um, I used to, you know, put on henna all the time, you know, and all of these things, it made me kind of really question who is deciding what creativity looks like, who is making those decisions. And I think, you know, these terms, I mean, again, you know, it's being described as working class. Yes, that's true. Um, and also, you know, being diverse, what does that actually really mean when every time you're talking about diversity, you know, to an extent, this becomes quite a tick box exercise, which I think can be quite um, problematic, but specifically, speaking about hard to reach, I think what you're doing is you're kind of putting the onus on the communities themselves. You're not recognizing that actually the organizations, perhaps the education system, it itself is slightly out of reach and you are kind of um, maybe not recognizing the barriers that are already kind of existing in place to stop people reaching you. Um, so I think it's kind of, we need to flip it on its head a little bit. And so I don't really use hard to reach at all. Um, I tend to prefer maybe underrepresented, underrepresented uh, maybe underserved, but even then, you know, I do recognize those terms can be problematic depending on, you know, who, who you're talking to and how you're talking about it. Um, but yeah, so the power of language and the way we're talking about the people that we want to engage is really important to kind of really interrogate um, those kind of, um, those kind of words and, and, and terms. Um, so if you have some power, this is a quote by Tony Morrison, if you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. Um, so again, it's about recognizing that if you are in a place of privilege and you, if you have some power, so you could be a senior leadership team, you know, part of a senior leadership team, you could be, um, you know, the director of a certain, you know, theatre company. You, your job, in my opinion, is really to work at the grassroots level and find out what you can do to remove um, barriers to access. And um, it's so important then to be able to talk to the right people in order you know, to do that. Um, the next slide is um, two images from one of my first projects I did as a creative producer. Um, it was called Beyond Borders, The Art of Integration. So I was working with um, Peter Sanders, who's quite a well-known um, photographer. He traveled the Muslim world documenting um, kind of the rich culture, the rich um, history um, of, of both the kind of Islamic world, but also the diversity within the um, Muslim world as well. Um, so the image on the left is a light-skinned woman, hazel green eyes, wearing um, the Union Jack, actually, as, as a headscarf, as a hijab. Um, and it was really interesting, you know, I, I showed this to young people. I worked with a, a, a two, three local schools. And, you know, some of them felt actually they didn't 
they didn't really identify with what this image was telling them. This idea that actually in order to, to you know, do they have to prove their Britishness to the extent that they have to, you know, show some sort of affiliation with, with the Union Jack, like is that really necessary? Um, whereas others were like, no, actually it's important for people to know that not all Muslims are kind of South Asian or, or look at a certain way that you also have white Muslims, white English in you know, Muslim. So there was a difference, I guess, in, in the conversations we had. Um, the image on the right is um, of a black lady wearing um, a white hijab. In the background, there's mosaic tiles. So she actually works. She's an artist that works with clay. She worked with young people in communities to um, create the mosaic tiles and the design is inspired by um, William Morris. Um, so that for me, I commissioned um, that image in particular for the Luton community. Again, it was kind of flipping it on its head that actually even within Muslim community, we have black Muslims and, you know, to almost um, look at the anti-blackness that is also present in society and how we can um, challenge that. And I think photography is a really great art form to be able to challenge, you know, the status quo. And I think, again, it's really important when you're having these conversations with, with young people um, to, to just navigate them very carefully. And I think, you know, have, have make sure that you are working with other people who understand, um, who understand the work. And you've got that actually diversity at a decision-making level as well to ensure that you, you understand the, the communities that you're working with. Um, so that led on to a, a project called Echoes of the Diaspora, which I did just a couple of years ago. This was specifically working with British Muslim women. I worked with a local secondary girls' school um, and also an, an organisation run by Muslim women called Lantern. Um, and it was about the girls and the women were saying to me every time they approached about a project, it's always got to do with something about um, jihadi prides or oppression or something to do with radicalization. They were so fed up with having to being approached just about such you know negativity and things that actually didn't represent them at all so what i felt is okay i want to do a project and the overarching theme was i was telling the women that if there's one story that you could share with the world what would it be um so the the project itself it was um live performance and the, the the women wrote their own work so they did poetry they did prose um and then they performed it but what specifically the reason i'm sharing this is the next slide is going to show you a small clip of um an interview um that bbc look east did on the project so what i'll do is i'll, I'll just show you that it's a very short clip hopefully it's going to work and then i'll talk a little bit about that from a cheeky little limerick to an epic tale of adventure, you can pretty much find a poem about anything. But tonight in Luton, there's a special performance funded by Arts Council England, which is all about using poetry to celebrate the lives of British Muslim women and give them a voice. One of these Hubble is there for us tonight, then. OK, so hopefully you heard that. Now, I'd given um, at the end of that interview, I, you know, she, the journalist asked me some questions, but I came home to watch this back and I saw that image um, that they'd used. So they'd used the image of a Muslim woman wearing a niqab, which is the face veil. And I thought it was really interesting that their choice to do that, because actually none of the women I'd worked with were, was wearing a face veil. Um, so already they were constructing something within the media about Muslim women. Um, and even in the interview, the journalist she said she'd wanted to speak to me about um, my grassroots work and working with um, the community. But her question to me at the time in the live interview was to say, um, oh, that, you know, how has it felt for you to giving Muslim women a voice? Now, all of a sudden, I had to go into this mode where I had to counter that. And I was like, well, no, actually, I'm not giving these Muslim women a voice. They have a voice. I'm literally just providing a, a platform. Um, but this is an example of another barrier that I faced. Instead of having the opportunity on national TV to talk about this wonderful work, I had to then spend that two, three minutes countering what I felt was actually really problematic. Um, and I know this happens to a lot of um a lot of people, especially Muslim women in, in the media, and that relationship is, uh, you know, at best is is quite um, strained, you know, I think. So, um, again, you know, when, when we're interviewing people or journalists, I think they really need to think about the, the questions that they're asking. Um, so very quickly um, to talk about um, this, I need to get rid of this little thing. Let me do that. Great. 
Um, so this is um, the long table. Um, so this is um, a dinner party uh, structured by Etika where a conversation is the only course. It's something devised by um, artist and academic Lois Weaver. This idea of the long table is a fantastic tool to be able to use, um, not just for young people, uh, literally across the board. You have, I hope you can see it in the image there, a literally a long table. You can have um, food and water on the table. You have colored pens. You can um, have a overarching question that you want people to, you know, um, to explore. And this can be done then, um, you know, people sit around the table. Um, people are in the audience sitting around um, and it's a really fluid way of having a conversation um, so this is the etiquette that you can see you know so um, talk is the only course um, there can be laughter there can be silence it's a really amazing piece of work and um, I did the long table I've done it quite a few times working with schools and working with um, young people and this is available um, you know online as well and but this is something that I kind of adapted a little bit um, with the support from my mentor where it also inv involves performances so you can make it really creative really artistic um, and um, young people it gives them a, a, it gives them a platform to voice their own opinions about something but kind of in, in, in a safe environment I think because they, they feel that they are being listened to um, so Oh, and this, I'll just give you a really short clip of, of what that looks like. Um, so let's do that. That's just a, a really short clip of, and this long table debate or long table conversation was part of the Beyond Borders um, project that I spoke about. Um, and obviously it, it was looking at identity and, and Britishness and what that means to young people. Um, oh, no, nope, I've seen that. However, what I did want to say is I then did another long table um, event at a different, um, this was actually at a college. Um, now I'm just gonna read out what you can see here in, in, in the little speech bubbles. Um, so I don't have um, the same confidence. They won't be interested in what I've got to say. If I speak my mind, people might get upset. I don't feel comfortable. They won't get what I'm saying. I haven't done as much research as they have. My experiences are completely different to theirs. Now, what happened is, um, the reason I've given it this slide title is silence always golden. So we did this long table debate. What, what actually transpired was the majority of the students, actually all of the students on the table were um, white British students. Majority of the students in the audience were from ethnic minorities. Um, now I noticed it pretty much straight away because uh, like I said, long term is very fluid. You don't just choose anyone. Anyone can take a seat at the table whenever they want, but the audience also has a choice. So when somebody at the table isn't speaking, you tap them on the shoulder, they then can vacate the chair and then you can take their position. Now these students who are majority South Asian, um, I, I went up to them and said, "Look, why don't you tap somebody on the shoulder and, and take their take take their seat?" And these are the these are some of the responses that I was getting from those students, which was actually really really heartbreaking um, because I was saying actually your stories are valid that you might feel um, 
you know, you, you don't have the same confidence or, you know, but what, what is making you feel like that? And this is when I think we have to talk about things like white privilege. And also what struck me was the students at the table who obviously, like I said, were predominantly white students, not noticing that actually they were, um, they, they, they'd taken control of this narrative and what they were talking about. And they hadn't even spotted the fact that they were all white, you know. And to some extent, they're young people. Maybe they don't, it's not their job to, to notice that. Um, but this, what we do know is this is what plays out then when, when in adults, when, you know, even in organizations. Now, how many of our organizations are all white? Majority may be old white men, maybe. Um, but even, you know, to the extent that, this then plays out in, in real life, so to speak. Um, so no matter how much I try to encourage these students to you know, take their seat at the table, they, they just didn't felt that they could. Um, so, I mean, that was a learning point for me, that actually what can I do for young people from minoritized communities to empower them? And again, the word empower is very problematic because it, there's a sense of kind of very you know, benevolence. So that's not obviously where, where it's coming from. Um, but yeah, so, what I've always done then with long table is kind of have a pre, like a pre, um, a pre event where I talk to lots of students to say, look, this is what it's about, you know, and you, so it, just so they feel kind of prepared. So on the day, actually, instead of going to sit in the, in the seat of the audience, they'll go straight and actually take a seat at the table and, and, and share what, you know, what's important to them. Um, I just kind of just weary of time I think it should be okay so um again you know you can see the long table is something I'm really passionate about I, I just uh, it's something I, I really love doing um I did another event and this is now not with young people this is adults and I remember somebody saying that oh why, why does art have to be political and you know I was like well surely all art is political right um the fact that my very existence as a visibly Muslim woman is political. When I go into space um, where I might be very much the only visible Muslim woman, anything that I say is judged. Anything that I do is definitely, um, you know, it's it's really kind of, um, I guess, interrogated about what I'm saying, you know. I'm, I'm also maybe apparently meant to be representing like the whole, you know, Muslim world every time I speak. Um, so yeah, I just think, you know, you, it's okay to be political. It's okay for your work because, you know, and you don't have to say I'm doing a political play or I'm doing a political project. Just listen to those voices that want to, um, want to share their stories and, um, yeah, I think it's just about being able to create that platform, which is just really, really important. Um, so this is a quote that I saw on Twitter. So every piece of art I've made has been a protest. Um, if it's not in the story on stage, it's in the story off stage. It's conscious and unconscious. I look at my more privileged counterparts and wonder how might it feel to make art for art's sake and not as a means to survive. Wild. So I remember um, seeing this and just it kind of hitting really, really um, deep. So just to end, um, what does um, inclusive practice look like? Um, so this is kind of just summing up, I hope, some of the things that I've spoken about. So using the right language, actively listening, but listening to the silences. So that example of the long table, if you're teaching or you're, you're doing a project and you notice that there's certain people not talking, the first actually action is to notice, are there any silences? And what does that really mean, you know, and what you can do about it? Um, so yeah, have diversity at a decision-making level, because again, if you have a pre-agenda, you might think, oh yeah, this is really brilliant and it suits everybody, um, but it could be making someone feel quite uncomfortable. So make sure that you have um, other people that you can talk about to bring in their kind of opinions as well. Um, so yeah, ensuring intersection representation, recognizing your privilege and using it to shift power dynamics. Um, so I guess this is kind of talking a little bit about what, what is what is allyship? What does it mean to be an ally and, and what can you do? Um, and yeah, passing the mic. So I think we sometimes end up in a situation where um, we, yeah, we just kind of do hold the mic actually. And actually it's a lot about if you do have that power and that privilege, how can you pass the mic to, to other people? Um, so I know there's um, a couple of conversations in, in the chat. Um, so yeah, it's the gem embracing each other's otherness is how we all learn progress and a uh, hugely positive interaction. Um, love the idea of the wrong table. Thank you. And thank you um, um, as well for your comment. Um, I did want to end with a spoken word piece. I don't know, Joe, is that okay? I, I know you're not here to, yeah? Uh, okay. 
So this, the spoken word piece is called um, I Have a Voice. Um, so it was really um, kind of capturing, I think, I guess some of the things that I've been talking about um, today. So I'll, actually what I'll do is I'll stop sharing the screen now because I don't need to do that. Oh, there's a lot more of you. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't realise. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, share that piece now. <clears throat> I am pure hypocrisy. I don't practice what I preach. I don't follow the things I believe. I tell my daughters they can be whatever they want to be. I tell my sisters to be patient in adversity. I teach my students to behave with humility. I tell my neighbours not to treat others with enmity. But who am I to tell others anything when I do nothing? I'm nothing but a coward. I've allowed myself to be subjugated, to be humiliated, to be completely annihilated. I have lost my voice. Buried under the pressure of a racist culture that suffocates any person who dares to question their place. I'm just a face without a name. My identity lost, evaporating into thin air whilst fighting the psychological warfare and voices of oppression. But I'm trying to make an impression on the living. I want to keep giving and giving because all I possess comes from al Qayyum, the self of subsisting. But I'm failing. I'm failing again and again. Our capitalist society has created a legacy where we talk about the gender pay gap but ignore ethnicity. And Islamophobic rhetoric is spreading toxicity. And I'm always attempting to prove my humanity because the fabric on my head demotes my very existence. And so my faith becomes a tool for resistance. But our lives have become devoid of any empathy. From Yarlswood and Rohingya in Myanmar to the women in Pakistan, Haiti and Syria, gender-based violence has deepened the scar from Weinstein and Nassau to the white saviour mentality giving aid to refugees in exchange for sexual favours. Time's up on these oppressive behaviours. Yet I remain silent. I want to speak but I'm complacent. My tongue, my tongue remains still wanting to avoid a confrontation fearful of retaliation. I think of the women of the past, teachers and scholars with the knowledge so vast, poets and warriors with a legacy that will last. I'm so ashamed that I speak of equal rights, but I don't possess the wall to fight. I do not defend the very people I claim to honor. How can I make change in this life when I have traded piety for materialist society, a hierarchy that leads to, su to suppression? But I must break out of this prison or face persecution, because it is true what the king said. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I know we've kind of reached, I think, the end. I did want to, if there's any couple of questions, but it's fine as, as well. But thank you so much for um, taking your time out to, to, to come to the presentation today. And um, yeah, feel free. My website is www.imranamahmood.co.uk if you ever wanted to get in touch um, for anything, more than happy for you um, to get in touch as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's really nice to, to see the comments. That means a lot. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there, there are a couple of questions, but you're more than happy for me to leave as well, because I think it's break time now, isn't it? So that's that's all good as well. Thank you. Yes, my poem is online. It, all my, um, yeah, my work is all online. I have a video gallery. Um, not this one in particular, actually, I haven't said that. There, there's another one, Sticks and Stones. Please check that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm quite proud of that piece as well. I am on Twitter. My Twitter is um, at Imrana underscore Mahmood. My IG is a bit more complicated. I'm, I'm not going to, I don't remember myself. I'm not great on IG. Um, but cool, thank you so much. And what I'll do is I'll stop recording now because this will be a bit weird. <laughs>